Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. So today on this channel, we're going to take a look at this device here, which is called the Super Console X Max. Now, if you're not familiar with them, Super Console X devices are preloaded emulation machines. So the idea is that they're basically plug and play devices. You should just be able to hook them up to your TV and start gaming immediately. Now, I've reviewed several of these devices here on this channel, so let me break down each one real quick. First, we had the Super Console X itself. This one's been around for a while, about a year at this point. Next came the Super Console X Pro. And not a lot of changes with this one, they basically just upgraded the firmware on it and then used a slightly better chip. Next came the Super Console X Stick, which had the same specs and firmware as the Pro, but with a smaller form factor, and they doubled the RAM to two gigabytes. And then recently they released the Super Console X Cube. This one has the same firmware and RAM as the Stick, but in a more fitting form factor, and with four front-facing USB ports, which is handy for plugging in controllers. And each of these baseline Super Console X devices cost around $50 to $100, depending on the size of the memory card that you get with it, and whether or not you get controllers. Now in terms of performance, the next down the line is the Super Console X Max, which we're reviewing here today. This one has the S905X3 chipset, which is quite a bit better than the baseline Super Console X, but it's still quite a bit of ways behind the next one in the Super Console X line, which is the Super Console X King. Now this one costs anywhere from $175 to $225, depending on how you spec it out. But this one here is definitely the most powerful of the Android-based boxes. And finally, the last Super Console X device that I have reviewed is the Mini PC. Now this one is not an Android box, it's actually a Windows machine. And this one has way better performance than any of the Android boxes. But unfortunately, it does come with a premium price. Now there are two other devices that are in this Super Console cinematic universe. And I haven't reviewed these, and I really don't plan on reviewing them in the future. And that's because these devices cost well over $400 each. And I think if you're going to spend that kind of money on an emulation machine, I find that you're actually better served to buy your own mini PC and then install Botticera on it yourself. And I have a video guide on how to do that. It's actually fairly easy. And another thing to consider is that maybe you could even just use an Xbox for your emulation needs. Anyway, back to the subject at hand, one other note I want to make is that this device is actually the same as a device I've already reviewed. And that's the HK1 box, also known as the makeup box. And you can usually find this thing for under $50. And so if you wanted to flash your own firmware and add your own games, this is probably going to be your cheapest option using this chipset. That being said, the pricing on the Super Console X Max is fairly competitive. If you wanted, you could get a baseline box loaded up with 30,000 games for about $78. And depending on whether or not you want to get the controllers that they provide, or you want to have a larger micro SD card to hold more games, you could be paying anywhere up to $125 for this machine. And so in this review, I'm going to take a hard look at whether or not that's worth that price difference. Do the conveniences of buying a preloaded box like this outweigh the cost of just doing it yourself? Okay, as they say in the Disney animated film Mulan, let's get down to business. Okay, let's start with a quick unboxing. Besides the console, you're going to find an HDMI cable, power outlet, here are the specs, a remote for the Android side, and then two controllers if you order them. Now, these controllers are not great. I would say if you have your own controllers, they're probably better than this one. The thing just feels somewhat lightweight, and the buttons are decent, but not great. You'll need to supply your own batteries, but it does come with a Wi-Fi dongle, so you don't have to worry about Bluetooth connection. And that is fairly handy. Also inside, you're going to find a 4GB microSD card, which is embedded with a bunch of video instructions. There's also a couple manuals in here. You're not going to need them at all. So here's the device itself. It's very lightweight and somewhat cheap feeling, but it is nice and small. As you can see, it has some of the specs here on the bottom. Around the sides, we have a slot for your micro SD card, power outlet, optical out, audio out, HDMI out, gigabit ethernet, and then two USB ports. Now, one thing I noticed when I first started plugging things in is just how awkward all the cords look when you have it plugged in, just based on the form factor itself. It kind of reminded me of a spider. Now, granted, if you're going to use wireless dongles and Wi-Fi instead of Ethernet, it really won't be that bad, but I wanted to show you just how bad it could look if you have everything plugged in. Okay, let's power it on and see what's going on inside. Now, let me explain a little bit about the firmware on this device. It actually uses a modified version of the Emulec firmware, which is a little bit shady in itself, just because Emulec is not supposed to be shipped with commercial devices like this. And then this preloaded image that they are using is taken from a team in Brazil who puts all this stuff together. And so the Super Console X team basically rebrands all of that, puts the Kin Hank logo on everything, and then sells it as their own. And honestly, there's a few layers of shadiness going on here when it comes to all this, but in the end, that may not matter to you in terms of just getting the games loaded onto a device. But that's a little background on how this all came together. All in all, it takes about 30 seconds to load up everything. 
but once you're in here, everything's going to be preloaded. I'm testing with a 256 gigabyte card, which has 50,000 games on it. And I'll just scroll real quickly through the games list here. If you want to actually see specific games, I would recommend going to their AliExpress page. They actually have links to Excel spreadsheets that show all the games that are loaded on this device based on the SD card size that you purchase. So navigating through the console is as simple as just moving over with the arrow and then selecting a console and then picking a game. Now the firmware image only comes with two different themes and you can choose between the two here, but you can also go into the updates and downloads section and then download new themes as well. So you're not limited to just these two, but honestly the two that they picked are some of the best that are available. I personally like this crystal theme better, but I'll stick with the original one just to give you a feel for how it's going to look out of the box. Now there's a lot of systems on here and you may not be interested in all of them. So say for example, you don't plan on playing any Vextrix games, it's pretty easy to hide this menu. What you do is you press start to get into the main menu and then go into game collection settings and systems displayed. And here you can uncheck any system you want and then it won't show up in the main menu. It won't actually delete the games, but it will make it a little bit easier to navigate through the interface. Now there's a few tweaks you need to do to get the best gameplay possible, but the number one thing I would recommend is go into the game settings and then turn off this smooth games option. That's going to turn off by linear filtering and it's going to make all the games look a lot sharper. So as you're navigating through your games list, you may find some random duplicates. I've never tried this game before, but let's see this one here since there's two of them. Okay, so opening up this mystery game here, you can see that it's actually been translated into Portuguese Brazilian. Like I said before, this is made by a Brazilian team. What's cool is that this was actually translated by Darth Vader. I didn't even realize he spoke this language. Pretty awesome. Anyway, hold down select and then press start twice to quit the game. And then if you want, in the menu, hold down the A button, which will bring up this options menu, and then you can select delete game. And that'll actually delete the game from your card. Now you're just left with one of these mystery games. And if you open it up, you can see that it's in English. So rather than show you some obscure indie games, let me show you some other ones that you may have heard of. For example here, Adventures of Lolo 3 has two copies. So let's check the first one, and sure enough, it's in Portuguese. So same thing here, hold down the A button, go into the menu, and then delete the game. Or if you're from Brazil, keep it. Now just in general, a lot of these low-powered systems like Nintendo, or even Famicom Disk System, they run just perfectly on this device. They're going to run just fine on any of the Super Console X devices. For example, here's Mario Bros. 2 in Japan, also known as the Lost Levels here in America. And so if you want to play a punishing platformer game, then you can check this one out. And that's one of the cool things about this Super Console X image, is that it has games that weren't originally available to us here in the Americas. And of course, if you want to go super old school, you can jump into some Atari games. They all work fine, of course. Or maybe there was a system you never got to try back in the day, for example, the Atari Lynx. For the most part, all of these low-end systems are going to have a good amount of games available. There are hundreds of Amiga games on here, so if you're from the European region, you'll probably be familiar with these. And performance is fairly good. As you can see, games like Fire and Ice and Lotus Turbo Challenge 3, they all run at full speed. Of course, the really demanding games like Jim Powers, they don't play at full speed. But I've been told that this game had a hard time on original hardware as well. Now, when it comes down to it, some of the game selection is not very robust. For example, if you look at TurboGrafx CD, they only have two games in here. Of course, if you go over to the regular TurboGrafx-16, there are hundreds in this one. But something to bear in mind is there are not hundreds of games for every single system. Now, some systems do require some slight configuration. For example, if you're going to play Game Boy, you'll find that there's no colorization, it's just a black and white image. So what you can do here is you press Select and X to get into the RetroArt Quick menu, and then go into the options to change some emulator options. For example, within this core, we can change all sorts of internal palettes to give your Game Boy games a little bit of coloring. And just like your old school systems like Nintendo and Atari, your Game Boy and Game Boy Color games are going to play just perfectly. Same thing with systems like Game Gear, as well as Game Boy Advance. None of these are going to have a problem at all. One game I always like to test is Golf on Virtual Boy, because surprisingly this one has a hard time working. And Virtual Boy games work just fine on this one. Now sticking with handhelds here, this comes with the standalone version of the Drastic Emulator for Nintendo DS, and it also works just fine. And you're going to be limited, for the most part, to games that don't require touchscreen controls. But one of the nice things about playing these on your TV is that you can see both screens at once, which is something you typically can't do in a retro handheld device. So that's handy. Okay, moving up to 16-bit systems here. 
Sega Genesis plays just fine, but in general this system actually plays really well on most emulation devices anyway. One note is that most of these systems actually have bezels on the side that correspond to the system you're launching. Unfortunately that's not true when it comes to Sega Genesis, it's showing ColecoVision instead. And it's easy enough to remove these bezels, you can just do that in the Emulec main menu. Okay, moving over to Super Nintendo. I often like to test with Star Fox because this is one of the hardest games to play, and it's running at 60 frames per second, no problem. Which is a really great sign. But when it comes to Super Nintendo, it's not your final option. Actually, Steven Seagal is the final option. And I had never even heard of this game until right now, but it is so funny. The controls are terrible. Steven Seagal can't even jump properly. But the funniest thing about it is that my five-year-old was watching me play this and he goes, hey, dad, this guy knows karate. <laughs> and I thought that was so funny. Anyway, moving on. The system comes preloaded with a modest amount of ports. A lot of these are your typical PC ports, but if you want to play something like Prince of Persia in the original <laughs> format, or even the PC port of Flashback, those are available to you. Now the next format I want to highlight are arcade platforms. There are actually three different arcade categories on this device. You have your arcade classics with about 2500 games, and this mostly plays your MAME style games. But there are also dedicated MAME and Final Burn Neo folders. Altogether you have something like 6 or 7 thousand arcade games to choose from. So if there's some obscure classic arcade game that you want to play, it's fairly likely that this image has you covered. Of course, classics like Mortal Kombat are going to be on here, and they play at full speed. But some of the later games like Killer Instinct or Tekken, they're not going to play very well. And typically when I'm reviewing these consoles, I'll find a lot of things I don't like, but then often there'll be a moment where I'm like, hey, this might be worth it. And of all the times for me to get that feeling, it was actually when I was playing this game here, Road Blasters. Now I honestly just picked this game at random, it seemed somewhat familiar, but as soon as I launched it, I realized that I had played this game for hours at one point. Back when I was a kid, my family had gone camping, and on the campgrounds they had one arcade machine, and it was this one, Road Blasters. And I remember at some point I just got sick of the great outdoors, and I ended up just spending a bunch of money playing Road Blasters instead. And so it was super cool to just pull up this game and relive that memory from about 30 years ago. And honestly, that's one of the joys of having a preloaded box like this, is that you just stumble on these old classics. And maybe Road Blasters isn't that game for you, maybe it's something like Saturday Night Slam Masters. Either way, I love the fact that there are so many arcade games on here. It's just a treasure trove of things to discover. Okay, so moving on to 32-bit and above, let's start with PlayStation 1. And no surprises here, PlayStation 1 plays perfectly on this. Even some of the rougher titles like Bloody Roar 2, every once in a while it would have a slight dip in the frame rate, but in general it was an enjoyable experience. And the 256GB card that I'm testing here had over 100 PS1 games on here. A lot of the classic role-playing games too. And I think it was really smart of them to load it up with a lot of the classic RPGs, because the amount of volume and content in a lot of these role-playing games means that you could get hundreds if not thousands of hours of gameplay out of the PlayStation 1 catalog they have on this disc. Okay, so now let's actually get into the performance side of things to see how this chipset really does with some of the harder systems. We'll start with Nintendo 64. And unfortunately, right out of the box, the outlook doesn't look so great. If you try to play F0X at 640 by 480 resolution, you can see here it's only capping out at about 40 frames per second. This is unplayably slow to me. So let's test out some of the other available emulators and see if that improves anything. Back on the menu, you just hold down A to get into the game settings, and then you can choose your emulator here. The default one is the top one here, so let's try the parallel core instead. And sadly, this core actually crashes. So let's try the 32-bit version of this emulator. And honestly, the performance between the 64 and the 32-bit versions is insignificant, but one of the things I did find, that is, if I went into the game options and I lowered the resolution to 320 by 240 then F0X played at full speed. Same goes with some of the lightweight games, for example, Mario Kart also plays at full speed at 320 by 240 But even using this lower resolution will not help you with some of the harder games, for example, Cruisin' USA plays at about 75% full speed. It's kind of like playing the entire game in slow-mo, it's not very fun. In general, most of your 3D heavy games, something like Perfect Dark or GoldenEye, they're going to play, but your mileage may vary. For example, here I found that Perfect Dark actually played pretty well, but I would expect something like GoldenEye, much like with Cruisin' USA, is going to be unplayably slow. Unfortunately, the Sega CD catalog is also not very robust, it only has two games inside. So let's check out Sega Saturn. This one has about a dozen, maybe 15 games altogether. But as you can see here, it's all of the very, very lightweight games. Mostly 2D games, things like that. And to be honest, they did a pretty good job of curating this list to make sure that they're going to play pretty well. 
So of the 15 or so Sega Saturn games that are on this SD card, yeah, they're going to play. But they're not going to be the classics you're expecting like Panzer Dragoon or Knights into Dreams. So in general, I would just not expect to have good Saturn performance outside of the ones that come bundled with this console. Okay, moving over to Sega Dreamcast, this one unfortunately had quite a bit of problems. Playing Crazy Taxi 2 at a 640x480 resolution did have a good amount of slowdown. It's up to you whether or not you consider this to be playable, but I found it to be quite laggy. Same thing with Dead or Alive 2, it felt like I was playing in molasses. And even if I lowered the resolution down to 320x240, which honestly makes a lot of these games look really bad, like the text is almost unreadable, it still didn't play at full speed. So that's really not a good sign when it comes to Dreamcast performance on Emulet. Even 2D games like Marvel vs. Capcom 2, which typically will play well on lower chipsets, still didn't play at full speed. But paradoxically, this game here, Project Justice, which is a 3D fighting game, played it very close to full speed. This was actually a really enjoyable experience. So I would just recommend experiment with the various Dreamcast games that are available on this device. Some games will be disappointing, for example Sonic Adventure 2 was pretty terrible. But even though Soul Calibur 2 had a hard time staying at 60 frames per second, even when it dips down to something like 55 frames per second, it was still a pretty enjoyable experience. Now, Atomus Wave and Naomi games are also loaded onto this device, so if you want to play some of these Sega Dreamcast based arcade games, they are available, but again, performance is not so great on these. Dolphin Blue had a lot of audio stuttering. Okay, moving over to PlayStation Portable, this one has the same issue as Sega Saturn. It's loaded up with about 30 games altogether, but they really curated it to games that work really well on this chipset. Also, by default, they actually have the RetroArch PSP core loaded, which honestly is not as efficient as the standalone PSP core. And swapping this out is as simple as just going into Game Settings, per System Advanced Configuration, and then picking PSP and then changing out the emulator to this one here. Now just for testing purposes, I'm going to turn off my frame skip, but then I'm going to upgrade the resolution to 2 times PSP. And sure enough, at least with the games that are preloaded on the Super Console X Max, they do run well at a 2x resolution on the standalone PSP emulator. Okay, so that's the extent of the performance testing on the Emule X side, but this system can actually dual boot into Android TV. In order to do that, you just press start, go into the main menu, go into quit, and then select reboot from NAND. That's going to boot from the 32 gigs of onboard storage that hosts the Android side. Now up top, you can see it just recognized the SanDisk SD card. What that means is it's actually reading all the games that are on your Emulek SD card. And that's a good sign, more on that here in a minute. But yeah, in general, this is what the interface looks like. There's a bunch of sketchy TV apps on here. I'm not even going to open these up. I really don't use any of these things here. We're just going to focus on gaming here with this review. I'm also going to plug in a USB keyboard and mouse just to make navigating a little bit easier here. So opening up the file manager, what you'll find is you have full access to all the ROMs in here. And what I ended up doing is making a folder called Android and then threw on a couple apps here so that I can sideload them onto this Android side. When you first select an APK, it's going to tell you you have to go into the settings and enable this app here to actually install other apps. So just go through the prompts here and give this file manager permission to install apps. After that, you could use standalone emulators on the Android side. And the nice thing is, is that once you tell these emulators to look in the Emulek folder, it's actually going to allow you to play the same games that you were playing on the other side. So here, I've loaded up all the Nintendo 64 games on the standalone emulator. And pulling up F-Zero X, which would not play at 640x480, you can see it's playing just fine on the Android side. Actually, it plays so well that I thought, maybe let's try upping the resolution. So here it is, running at 720p at basically full speed again. That's a really great sign. This is about four times better than what we were seeing on the Emulex side. Even games like Cruise in USA got really close to playing at full speed. That's a super good sign. And so what I realized from this testing is that you can kind of take advantage of this opportunity on the Android side. So hypothetically, you could use the Emulex side for all of your lower end systems, basically everything up through PS1. And then if you really wanted to play Nintendo 64, just pop over to the Android side open up the standalone emulator, and all of a sudden you're playing some of the hardest games that you can play on Nintendo 64 at a higher resolution, all the way up to 720p in most cases. Now sadly, as impressive as the Nintendo 64 emulation is, the Dreamcast emulators really can't keep up. Here's the ReDream emulator, which typically does really well on Dreamcast. As you see here, I'm still having a fair amount of slowdown, even with games like Sonic Adventure 2. It's dipping down to something like 45 frames per second. 
And unfortunately, Dead or Alive 2 is still unplayable. This actually dips to under 40 frames per second. Soul Calibur 2 tends to play pretty well. I did find they capped out at 50 frames per second, which is an indication to me here that they're using a European ROM. So you might be able to add your own games and see if you get better performance. Now moving over to the standalone PSP emulator, I decided to just go for it and upgrade the resolution to 3x. And sure enough, the preloaded games play perfectly at 3x resolution. It was so impressive that I decided to actually load some of my own games to see how the performance worked. So I want to test it on one of the harder games to play on PSP, which is OutRun 2006. And as you can see here, unfortunately, 3x resolution with no frame skip does not play at full speed. You're only getting about 22 frames per second. So lowering down the resolution to 2x gives you about 26 to 28 frames per second, but unfortunately that's still really slow. So we could turn on frame skipping, give it a frame skip of 1, but unfortunately OutRun 2006 is not a very enjoyable experience with frame skip on. So unfortunately, I would say that this game is really not playable. Moving over to one of the easier games to play on PSP, Ridge Racer does not play at 2x speed with no frame skip on. Even if you drop the resolution down to the native PSP resolution, you're still not going to get full speed unless you turn frame skip on. So unfortunately, unless you plan on using only the preloaded PSP games, PSP performance is just not that great either on the MULX side or the Android side. When it comes down to it, the shining star on the Android side is only Nintendo 64. All of these games played significantly better than they did on the MULX side. Now to get back to the MULX side, you just go into the apps folder and then find the power menu app. And within here, just select either power off or reboot. And then when the system powers up or reboots, it's just going to automatically go back onto the MULX side. So it's very easy to swap back and forth just using your controller. So yeah, like I said, I would expect to play PS1 and below and all your arcade games here on the MULX side. When it comes to Nintendo 64, you definitely owe it to yourself to try the Android side. For Dreamcast and PSP, unfortunately the performance is just not quite there. Okay, so the question of the hour here is whether or not the Super Console X Max itself is worth the cost. And let's just give it a baseline of say $80. Now for $50, you could get the HK1 box instead and then load MULX on it yourself as well as still take advantage of the Android side. And so that's going to be your choice right there. Is the $30 difference worth it to you? To have instant access to a bunch of ROMs and to potentially have a couple controllers that you could use? Or would you rather do it yourself? In the end, what you're doing is paying for time. Because backing up all of your games and building a ROM library, it's something that takes a lot of time. I've been playing around with emulation for over a year at this point, and my collections are nowhere near complete. So in the end, it really depends on what you want to do. Are you the type of person that wants to do it yourself? Or would you rather someone gives you a preloaded system, complete with controls and a remote and an SD card, and just plug that thing in and start playing games? Or if you just want to have a solution that you can buy for a friend so they can just start playing games because they don't know any of this stuff. And I think in those cases, yeah, the Super Console X Max is a pretty good deal. The performance is quite a bit better than it is on the original Super Console X devices, while not being as expensive as something like the Super Console X King or any of those mini PCs. Alright everyone, that's it for this video. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful. And we will see you next time. Happy gaming.